What if I told you that if you cleverly layered a bunch of sine waves on top of one another, you could perfectly recreate any sound? While this is technically true, it's kind of like saying that if you cleverly layered a bunch of atoms on top of one another, you could perfectly emulate Buddhism. Or is it? Today, I'm going to attempt to simplify additive synthesis and hopefully, using nothing but sine waves, steal my melodica soul. <laughs> If you've watched my previous videos, you probably have a good understanding of how subtractive synthesis and FM synthesis work. But today, I want to talk about additive synthesis. And let's just start right from the top. I'm 100% confident that additive synthesis is the future of synthesizer technology. In fact, I'm 100% confident that when combined with deep learning, additive synthesis is the future of all things related to audio. And while I do want to go further into this in the future, I don't want to try and be the Elon Musk of Guitar Center today. I will do my best to explain the basic so you can have an understanding of just how incredibly powerful existing additive synthesizers are. Like I mentioned before, additive synthesis is just a bunch of sine waves bundled together. And when combining sine waves, math gives us a lot of hints on how a harmonic note or timbre is made. A harmonic timbre, for example, would be a piano. Uh, it's easy to identify the notes being played on a piano. An inharmonic timbre would be a cymbal. They often have a note, but it's not a clear one. Luckily, for harmonic notes, we have the Fourier series to guide us. The Fourier series decomposes periodic functions into the sum of a bunch of oscillating functions. A periodic function is basically a recipe for something that repeats itself over and over again in intervals. So let's say that I could program this lion, and I wanted it to bark every 600 milliseconds in a periodic function. F over lion barking plus 600 pi equals... <laughs> Wow, look at that. So the recipe for an infinitely looping sine or an endless sine wave tone is a periodic function. The Fourier series is a simple way of combining a whole bunch of periodic functions methodically to create a new function. It gives us hints where the frequencies of sine waves will become harmonics or partials in our timbre or tone. An easy way of doing this is starting with a 100 hertz sine wave and then just adding another sine at 200 hertz and then another at 300 and 400 and so on. If you're doing that, your fractional part or F, aka your periodic function, is just adding 100 hertz to every new sine. This can go on for infinity, which would suck if our hearing wasn't limited to around 20,000 hertz. But luckily, we never have to worry about adding sines to follow the Fourier beyond that frequency limited by the range of human hearing. I'm going to use Adobe Audition to create some sine waves, Audacity and a wide range of other free programs can also do this. So as I mentioned earlier, let's say that our fractional part or bass frequency is 100 hertz. We're going to start from 100 hertz and then just keep adding 100 hertz to every new sign. And since Audition only allows me to do five signs at once, I'm going to have to do this process a total of, I don't know, I'm going to try and do it 10 times. Whatever gets me up to like 4,000, 5,000 hertz, I'll probably lose my mind by then. And I'm also going to emulate another periodic function by removing a decibel for each partial, like so. So we're going to go the second partial, which is 200 hertz. We're going to go to 40 point negative 40.5. Then the next one we're going to go to negative 41, and the next one will be negative 41.5, and the next one will be negative 42. So 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, and then we're going down by half a decibel for each partial. Now, since I have to do this a bunch more times. <laughs> So my partials look like this. Do you know what this is? It's a dull saw wave. And if I did this about 128 more times, it would sound like a normal saw wave. But here's the dull one. So that's a saw that we just made out of signs. Ready now. So without going back into like making 50 partials like we did before, I'm just gonna make a ghetto saw with these five partials here. So we got 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, and our periodic function is 100 hertz. That's what we're growing by. So here we go. Great, sounds like a saw with a filter over it. So I'm gonna skip a fractional part. So what my new periodic function will be is 200. So instead we'll be adding 200 to everything. So 100, 300. 500, 700, 900, and now we have a square. So we just made a saw and square out of sine waves. 
So the reason I'm even showing this to you is because using the Fourier series guides us on perfect harmonics, allowing us to change the timbre of a note. Otherwise, without this guidance, making a square wave by ear would be nearly impossible. This might help us on our quest to steal my melodica's soul. So how do we find out my melodica's harmonic fingerprint? Well, we can use Fourier analysis to see which frequencies my melodica is hitting in its timbre. If we're lucky, it'll settle perfectly into partials in a way where we can reverse engineer the periodic function and see exactly what the consistent fractional value is. In a VST plugin that would allow us to emulate the timbre of the melodica in just one short line of code. If that's the case, I'll just set up an algorithm and reactor. If I can't find a fractional value, then we're stuck experimenting with manually entering frequencies indicated in the frequency analysis. But either way, this isn't exactly mission impossible. I need to be clear, for future reference, this is not an efficient way of doing additive synthesis in 2017, but it's an excellent way of understanding how additive synthesis works. I recorded the melodica, and here we can see the frequency analysis. And yay, as suspected, it looks like we can uh, see the Fourier series and get a pretty easily traceable periodic function. I'm gonna copy this data, and it's gonna be a kind of insane amount and I'm gonna paste it into a spreadsheet. Whoa, we have over 32,000 partials. Luckily, we're not simulating the background noise of my room or, or anything that's inaudible to the human ear. So I'm gonna remove everything under 50 decibels. Next, I'm gonna sort the database by frequency, and all of a sudden we start to see that there's a majority of waste here, 262.21, 262.94, 263.67. Let's just round our base partial to 263. Next, we have these. Let's round this to 526. 526 minus 263 equals 263. So let's test this upwards now. 526 plus 263 equals 789, that's our next partial. And there it is, already mapped out. The melodica's fractional part is 263, which means my little melodica is out of tune uh, since I think C4 is 261.5 to 26 something. So whatever, don't judge me on my melodica tuning, please. But our work is done with the frequency since we've verified on a scientific level that this thing is using a pretty standard harmonic partial. But now we have to worry about the amplitude, which is kind of all over the place in the graph. So I'm taking this reactor and building myself an annoyingly large bank of sine waves bound to harmonic partials so I can easily edit it by ear rather than punching in the numbers exactly. While it's not as accurate for this purpose, it does make a better interactive session and learning experience than watching me punch in numbers all day. One important thing to note here, so that you know what you're looking at, I'm bundling each partial into a macro, which is a great way of organizing your nodes. In my macros, I have an input coming from my MIDI keyboard going into an exponentiator, going into a multiplier, going into a logarithm. That sounds incredibly complicated, but it's not at all. The exponentiator just converts the MIDI note to a pitch frequency. Then the logarithm just converts the hertz of the pitch back into a note. Now, the important part, my multiplier has a knob with a range of 30 values and a step size of one, meaning it will always land the note on a partial. If I were making an atonal sound, I would have a way larger value range and smaller step size, but I want this knob to guide my frequencies. So I spent a little bit more time than I planned on this and I made a little interface and you can download this entire ensemble in the link below. And basically you have your amplitude here, you have your harmonics or partials here, um, and it's just a 16 partial simple additive synthesizer that you can experiment with. And this is just an ADSR and then you have a little scope so you can see your waveform. Now, the moment of truth. I actually didn't, uh, I was listening to Jamericoy this entire time and I actually just did this the hardcore way and uh, used the database to figure out these amplitudes of the partials. And uh, this is the moment of truth right here. So let's play the melodica sample. Okay, this is the recorded melodica. All right. And now since OBS does not support ACO, I have to do this the hard way. So let's listen to this. I think we did it. I'm very happy with that. Um, that again, I'm just capturing the timbre. I'm not capturing the that early part. That's physical modeling, and you would actually add in noise 
and bring it up and we'll get into that in another video but as far as capturing the soul of the melodica I think we're good. I think we did it. It's important for me to point out that this is not sampling. To sample my melodica and avoid the timbre changing every few notes, I would have to record every single note with various velocities, save each file, and assign it to keys. So that's 37 keys with a measly four velocity layers per key. Uh, that's 148 10-second mono wave files. That's about 90 megs of sample memory for a basic melodica. Now, resynthesizing this inside lower-level audio languages like C sound would be, I don't know, 20 kilobytes. That's that's like 4,000 times smaller. Your processor would simply be running a few simple periodic functions rather than 148 wave files. My point being, it makes incredible sound potentially possible on single board microcontrollers or in game development where memory allocation and CPU resources need to be at maximum efficiency. Once we incorporate deep learning though, those 100 gigabyte contact sample libraries become a thing of the past. More importantly, if you played a violin sequence on an accurate additive synthesizer, then ran that sequence through a data set of recording violin performances, you have completely and entirely made sampling obsolete. And that's not even the fun part. In my last album, Piety of Ashes, I did the additive synthesizer swap a few times. Uh, notable examples in Starlight. You think this is a cello, right? Well, at the end of the song, I began to randomize the 512 signs, making up the additive recreation of what you may have thought was the cello. Admittedly, that might be a bit of showing off, but in my next additive synthesis video, we're going to explore exactly what we can do when our sounds are literally limited only by our imaginations and maybe our CPU power. Hey, and if you learned anything from this video, subscribe and share it. And if there's anything you want me to cover in the future, let me know in the comments. Bye-bye.